Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Brookings. I'm Benjamin Wittes, a senior fellow in governance studies here. And I think this event will uh, probably set a Brookings record uh, for the height differential between guest <laughs> and host. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, the director's actually not that <coughs> short. Um, so um, <coughs> I'm actually going to be very, very brief because uh, we have limited time, and the more of it that I use, the less of it we can use for you know, dialogue between you guys and the director. Uh, Director Comey's here to talk about encryption uh, and the uh, problems it creates for law enforcement. Um, this is a subject that the number of people here testifies to the amount of interest in, uh, in the subject uh, all over the place right now. Post Snowden, um, post uh, a lot of debates about surveillance reform. Uh, Mr. Comey has a, has a different perspective, um, which is about the impacts related uh, to federal and state law enforcement. Um, format today is going to be very simple. He's going to uh, give relatively brief remarks. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, we're going to uh, move to a conversational format. I'm going to give, uh, ask a few questions, and then we're going to go to you. Um, and uh, we're going to use as much of the time as possible uh, for uh, questions from the audience. Um, when I do that, we're going to um, we're going to do that in a um, you know as as try, trying to do it in as uninterrupted a form as possible. So please just signal me if you want if you want to get in, um, and when wait for the mic to come around and introduce yourself by name and organizational affiliation. Keep questions very brief <coughs> and in the form of a question so that we can uh, have as significant a discussion as possible. Um, with that, I will turn it over to the director, who needs uh, no introduction to this audience. Uh, welcome back to Brookings. That small difference. I'm going to adjust that mic. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, Ben. And good morning, everybody. It's great to be here at Brookings. Uh, I'm told also that I am uh, going to be the subject of a recorded podcast for Lawfare, which is a blog I read every single day. So that's actually the real reason I'm here and so excited. Um, what I'd like to do is share some thoughts with you. And then for me, the most important part is going to be our conversation together. So I thank you in advance for asking whatever is on your mind. Um, I've been on this job now for one year and one month. Sometimes I joke uh, and express my tenure in months remaining as if I'm incarcerated or something. But I don't mean that. I have what I believe is the best job in the entire world because I get to come to work at the FBI every day. Um, over the last year, I've confirmed what I long believed, that the FBI is a remarkable place filled with amazing people doing amazing work all over the country and all over the world every day. And I've also confirmed what I've long known, that a commitment to the rule of law and civil liberties is at the core of the FBI. I believe it is the organization's spine. Uh, but as you know, we confront serious threats, uh, threats that are changing every single day. And I want to make sure that I have every lawful tool available uh, to make sure that I'm addressing those threats. And so I see this as an opportunity to begin a national conversation about something that is affecting, in a serious way, uh, the investigative work we do. I want to talk to you about the impact of emerging technology on law enforcement. And within that context, I think it's very important for me to talk about the work we do at the FBI what we need to do the work that we've been entrusted to do. I believe there are a fair number of misconceptions in the public discussion about what we in government collect, especially we at the FBI, and the capabilities we have for collecting information. I think my job is as best as I can to try to explain and to clarify where I can the work of the FBI. Uh, but at the same time, I really want to get a better handle on your thoughts because those of us in law enforcement can't do what we need without your trust and your support, and we have no monopoly on wisdom. And my goal today is not to tell people what to do. My goal is to urge our fellow citizens to participate in a conversation as a country about where we are, where we want to be, uh, especially with respect to law enforcement authorities. So let me start by talking about the challenge of what we call going dark. Technology has forever changed the world we live in. All of you know this every single day. We're online. 
in one way or another all day long. Many of us are online during the night when we should be sleeping. Our phones and our computers have become reflections of our personalities. They reflect our interests and our identities. They hold much of what is important to us in life. And with that comes a desire to protect privacy and our data. We want to be able to share our lives with the people we choose to share our lives with. I very much feel that way. But the FBI also has a sworn duty to try to keep every American safe from crime and from terrorism. And technology has become a tool of choice for some very dangerous people. And unfortunately, the law has not kept pace with technology, and this disconnect has created the significant public safety problem we have long described as going dark. And what it means is this. Those charged with protecting our people aren't always able to access the evidence we need to prosecute crime and prevent terrorism, even with lawful authority. We have the legal authority to intercept and access communications and information pursuant to a court order, but we often lack the technical ability to do that. We face two overlapping challenges. <clears throat> the first concerns real-time court-ordered interception of what we call data in motion, such as phone calls or emails or live text or chat sessions. The second challenge concerns court-ordered access to data stored on our devices, such as email or text messages or photos or videos, what we call data at rest. And both real-time communication, data in motion, and stored data, data at rest, are increasingly encrypted. So let me start by talking about uh, court-ordered interception and then talk about the challenges posed by the proliferation of different means of communication and encryption. In the past, doing electronic surveillance was straightforward. We identified a target phone used by a bad guy with a single carrier. We got a court order for a wiretap, and under the supervision of a judge, we collected the evidence we needed for prosecution. Today, there are countless providers, countless networks, countless means of communicating. We have laptops, we have smartphones, we have tablets. We take them to work, to school. We take them from the soccer field to the Starbucks over many different networks using many different apps. And so do those conspiring to harm us. They use the same devices, the same networks, the same apps to make plans to target victims and to cover up what they're doing. And that makes it very tough for us to keep up. If a suspected criminal is in the car and he switches from cellular coverage to Wi-Fi, we may be out of luck. If he switches from one app to another, or from a cellular voice service to a voice or messaging app, we may lose him. We may not have the capability to quickly switch lawful surveillance between devices, methods, and networks. The bad guys know this. They're taking advantage of it every day. In the wake of the Snowden disclosures, the prevailing view is that the government is sweeping up all of our communications. That is not true. And unfortunately, the idea that the government has access to all communications at all times has extended even more unfairly to law enforcement uh, that is working to obtain individual warrants approved by judges to intercept the communications of suspected criminals. Some believe that law enforcement, and especially the FBI, has these phenomenal capabilities to access any information at any time, that we can get what we want, when we want it, by flipping a switch. That is the product of too much television. It frustrates me because I want people to understand that law enforcement needs to be able to access communications and information in a lawful way to bring people to justice. We do that pursuant to the rule of law with clear guidance and strict oversight. But even with lawful authority, the going dark problem is we may not be able to access the evidence and the information that we need. Current law governing the interception of communications requires that telecommunications carriers and broadband providers build interception capabilities into their networks for court-ordered surveillance. But that law, the Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA, was enacted 20 years ago, a lifetime in the internet age. And it doesn't cover at all new means of communication. Thousands of companies provide some form of communication service, and most are not required by statute to provide lawful intercept capabilities to law enforcement. What that means is that an order from a judge to monitor a suspect's communication may amount to nothing more than a piece of paper. Some companies fail to comply with the court order. 
Some companies can't comply because they've not developed the capabilities. Other providers want to provide assistance, but they have to take the time to build interception capabilities, which takes not just time, but a lot of money. The issue is whether companies not subject currently to CALEA should be required to build lawful intercept capabilities for law enforcement. Now, to be clear, we are not seeking to expand our authority to intercept communications. We are struggling to keep up with changing technology and to maintain our ability to actually collect the communications we are authorized to collect. And if the challenges of real-time data interception threaten to leave us in the dark, encryption threatens to lead us all to a very, very dark place. Here's what I mean by that. Encryption is nothing new, but the challenge to law enforcement and national security officials is markedly worse with recent default encryption settings and encrypted devices and networks, all in the name of increased security and privacy. For example, with Apple's new operating system, the information stored on many iPhones and other Apple devices will be encrypted by default. Shortly after Apple's announcement, Google announced plans to follow suit with its Android operating system. This means that the companies themselves will not be able to unlock phones, laptops, and tablets to reveal photos or documents or email or stored texts or recordings in those, doc in those instruments. Look, both companies are run by good people who care deeply about public safety and national security. I know that. And they're responding to a market demand that they perceive. But the place that this is leading us is one that I suggest we should not go without careful thought and debate as a country. At the outset, the good folks at Apple say something that's reasonable, which is, look, it's not that big a deal because law enforcement can still get the data from the cloud because folks are going to back up their devices to the cloud and the FBI with lawful authority can still access the cloud. But here's the problem with that. Uploading to the cloud doesn't include all of the stored data on the bad guy's phone first, which has the potential to create a black hole in and of itself. But second, um, if the bad guys don't back up their phones routinely, or if they opt out of uploading to the cloud, the data will only be found on the encrypted devices themselves. And it's the people most worried about what's on the device who will be most likely to avoid the cloud and to make sure that law enforcement cannot access incriminating data. Encryption just isn't a technical feature. It's part of a marketing strategy, but it will have very serious consequences for law enforcement and national security agencies at all levels. Sophisticated criminals will come to count on these means of evading detection. It's the equivalent of a closet that can't be opened, a safe deposit box that can't be opened, a safe that can't ever be cracked. And my question uh, to facilitate this, this conversation is, at what cost? Um, let me try uh, to correct some misimpressions that I think are connected to this. The first is that folks say, good folks say, look, you're still going to have access to metadata, which includes telephone records and location information uh, stored with the telecommunications carriers. And that is absolutely true. But metadata does not provide the content of any communication. It's incomplete information. And even that is difficult to access when time is of the essence. I wish we had time in our work, especially when lives are on the line. We usually don't. There is a misconception that building a lawful intercept solution is all about building a backdoor, one that foreign adversaries or hackers could exploit. That also is not true. Uh, we are not seeking a backdoor approach. We want to use the front door with clarity and transparency. We want clear guidance provided by law. We are completely comfortable with court orders and legal process, front doors that provide us the evidence and information we need to investigate crime and prevent attacks. Cyber adversaries, there's no doubt, are going to try to exploit any vulnerability they find. But we think it makes more sense to address any security risks by developing intercept, intercept solutions at the front end in the design phase, rather than resorting to patchwork solutions when law enforcement comes knocking after the fact. And with a sophisticated encryption, there may be no solution at all, leaving the government at a total dead end. Again, all in the name of privacy and network security. Another misperception that I've seen is folks sometimes say, but you could uh, guess the password or break it with a so-called brute force attack. Here's the truth. Even with a supercomputer, 
we would have difficulty with today's high-level encryption. And some devices have a setting where the encryption key itself is erased after too many attempts to break the password, meaning no one, no matter how big their computer, can access the data. And sometimes I've also heard reasonable folks ask this question. Can't you just compel the owner of the device to provide you the password? And the answer is that's a reasonable question, but unfortunately, no. Um, even if we could compel them as a legal matter, think about the choice that that bad guy has to make. Imagine a child predator in custody choosing between a 30-day contempt sentence for refusing to comply with the direction from a court to hand over the password, or a 30-year sentence for the production and distribution of child pornography. That choice is not hard to predict. Um, so let me talk about some case examples that I hope will illustrate what I'm worried about. Um, think about your life without your smartphone, without internet access, or without texting and emailing or the apps you use every day. Um, I'm guessing most of you would feel lost or left behind. I'm told that people much, much cooler than I, which is nearly everyone, um, calls this FOMO or fear of missing out. Um, with going dark, those of us in law enforcement and public safety have a major fear of missing out. Missing out on predators who exploit the most vulnerable among us, on violent criminals, on terrorist cells, and a whole lot of other bad people. The more we as a society rely on these devices, the more important they are to law enforcement and public safety officials for reasons that I think make sense to you. We have seen case after case, from homicides and car crashes to drug trafficking, child abuse, child exploitation, and exoneration, where critical evidence came from smartphones, hard drives, and online communication. But let me just give you some examples of cases that involve the content of smartphones. In Louisiana, a known sex offender posed recently as a teenage girl to entice a 12-year-old boy to sneak out of his house to meet this supposed young girl. The predator posed as a taxi driver. He took this young boy, murdered him, and then tried to alter and delete evidence on both his and the victim's cell phones to cover up the crime. Both phones were instrumental in showing that the suspect enticed this child into his taxi and that suspect was sentenced to death in April of this year. In Louisiana, excuse me, in, in, I was in Louisiana. In Los Angeles, police investigated the death of a two-year-old girl from blunt force trauma to her head, and there were no witnesses. Text messages stored on her parents' cell phones between the two of them and with other family members proved that the mother had caused the young girl's death, and that the father knew what was happening and failed to stop it. The text messages stored on their devices also proved that they failed to seek medical attention for the little girl for hours after she convulsed, that they went so far as to paint her uh, with blue paint to cover her bruises before calling 911. Confronted with the evidence from the phones, both parents pled guilty. In Kansas City, the DEA investigated recently a drug trafficking organization tied to heroin distribution, homicides, and to robberies. And the DEA got search warrants for the smartphones used by some members of the group. And they found stored on the phone text messages that outlined the distribution train and tied that group to the supply of lethal heroin that had caused 12 overdoses and five deaths in high school students in that area. In Sacramento, a young couple and their four dogs were walking down the street at night when a car ran a red light and struck them, killing all four dogs instantly and severing the young man's leg and leaving the young woman in critical condition. The driver fled and that young guy died several days later. Using red light cameras near the scene, the California Highway Patrol identified and arrested a suspect and seized his smartphone. The GPS data stored on that phone placed the suspect at the scene of the accident and showed that he fled California right afterwards. He was convicted and is serving a 25 years to life term for second degree murder. And lastly, I mentioned ways in which you've used it to prosecute. It has been used to exonerate innocent people. In Kansas, data from a cell phone was used not long ago to prove the innocence of several teens accused of rape. Without access to the phone or the ability to recover a deleted video from that phone, several innocent young men could have been wrongly convicted. These are cases, just a few examples that I pulled together, in which we had access to the evidence we needed. But we're seeing more and more where we believe significant evidence is on that phone or on that laptop and we can't crack the password. If this becomes the norm, I suggest to you that homicide cases could be stalled, suspects walked free, child exploitation 
not discovered and prosecuted. Justice may be denied because of a locked phone or an encrypted device. So here are my personal thoughts about this. I am deeply concerned about it as both a law enforcement officer and a citizen. I understand some of this thinking in a post-Snowden world, but I believe it is mostly based on a failure to understand why we in law enforcement do what we do and how we do it. I hope you know that I am a huge believer in the rule of law, but I also believe that no one in this country should be beyond the law. There should be no law-free zones in this country. I like and believe very much that we need to follow the letter of the law to examine the contents of someone's closet or the contents of their cell phone. But the notion that the marketplace could create something that would prevent the closet from ever being opened, even with a properly obtained court order, makes no sense to me. I think it's time to ask, so where are we as a society? Are we no longer a country that is passionate both about the rule of law and about there being no zones in this country beyond the reach of that rule of law? Have we become so mistrustful of government and law enforcement in particular that we are willing to let bad guys walk away, willing to leave victims in search of justice? I know there will come a day where it will matter a great deal to innocent people that we in law enforcement cannot access certain types of data or information, even with court authority. We have to have discussions about this before those days come. I believe that people should be skeptical of government power. I am. I think this country was founded by people who were, who knew you could not trust people in power, and so they divided the power among three branches to set interest against interest. And then they wrote a Bill of Rights to ensure that the papers and effects of the people are secure from unreasonable searches. But the way I see it, the means by which we conduct surveillance through telecommunications carriers or internet service providers who have developed lawful intercept solutions is an example of the government operating the way the founders designed it, with the executive, the legislative, and judicial branches proposing, enacting, executing, and overseeing legislation pursuant to the rule of law. I suggest that it's time that the post-Snowden pendulum be seen as having swung too far in one direction in a direction of fear and mistrust. I think it's time to have an open and honest debate about liberty and security. Some have suggested uh, that there is a conflict between liberty and security. You have to give up a little of one to get some of the other. And I reject that framework. Uh, I think when we are at our best in law enforcement, in national security and public safety, we are looking to enhance security and liberty. When a city posts police officers on a dangerous playground, security has promoted liberty the freedom to let a child play without fear. The people of the FBI are sworn to protect both security and liberty. It isn't a question for us of conflict. We care deeply about protecting liberty through due process, while also safeguarding the citizens that we're here to protect. So where do we go? These are tough issues. Uh, finding the space and time in our busy lives to understand them is hard. That's why I'm so grateful to Ben and to Brookings for carving out some space for us. Intelligent people can and do disagree, and that's what's awesome about a democracy. That is what is great about American life, smart people disagreeing to come to the best answer. I have never been, I don't think, anyone who is a scaremonger, but I'm in a dangerous business. So I want to ensure that we discuss uh, the impact of limiting the court-authorized law enforcement tools we use, um, and that we talk about what are the losses associated with our inability to collect information pursuant to law. We in the FBI are going to continue to throw everything we have at this challenge. Um, it's costly, it's inefficient, it takes time, but we are going to work to make sure that whenever we can, we're able to execute court authority. But we need to fix this problem. It's long past time. We need assistance and cooperation from companies to comply with lawful court orders so that criminals around the world cannot seek safe haven. We need to find common ground. We care about the same things. I said it because I meant it. The companies that we've talked about, that we've talked to, are run by good people who care about the same things. We know an adversarial posture is not going to help any of us to make progress here. We understand the private sector's need to remain competitive in the global marketplace. It is not our intent to stifle innovation or to undermine U.S. companies, but we have to find a way to help these companies understand what we need, why we need it, and how they can help while protecting privacy rights 
and network security. We need our private sector partners to take a step back, to pause, to consider, I hope, a change of course. But we also need a regulatory and legislative fix here to create a level playing field so that all communication service providers are held to the same standard. And so that those of us in law enforcement, national security, and public safety can continue to do the job you've entrusted us to do in the way you want us to do it. Perhaps most importantly, we need to make sure the American public understands the work we do and the means by which we do it. I really do believe we can get there. I really do believe that we can find a reasoned and practical approach uh, and that we can do it together. I do not have a perfect solution to suggest to you, but I think it's important to start the discussion. I am very happy, in fact, eager to work with Congress, with our partners in the private sector, with my law enforcement and national security counterparts, and with the people we serve to find the right answer, to find the balance that we need to find both liberty and security. So thank you for being here today to participate in this conversation. Thank you for caring about these issues. I look forward to your questions. So we're gonna, I'm going to ask a couple questions, and then I'm going to kick it to you guys. Um, I just want to start, why now? I mean, the crypto wars, <coughs> people thought they were kind of resolved 20 years ago. Uh, there's stresses on Kalia, but they're, they don't seem appreciably different than they were a year ago. And yet, all of a sudden, this whole thing has been reignited. Um, why? That's a great question. I think it is an accumulation, um, another brick in the load of the going dark, that especially hit me when I took this job a year ago and got briefed on our capabilities and the limitations on them. And I do think a catalyst, for, I can only speak for me personally, was um, the announcement of the default encryption on the devices, which are ubiquitous. Um, and I looked at that and I thought, you know, these are good folks responding to a market imperative, but holy cow, where are we going? And so that energized me to say, we got to have a conversation about this. And is, you know, you left government, I think, last in 2003. You, uh, 2005, sorry. You were not, a, you were not in, um, the, on the investigative side at the time, but you certainly had a sense of, of how light and dark things were. How different is it today than it was, you know, when, when you came back into government, how much darker is the world than before you left? Uh, my sense is dramatically darker, especially because of the proliferation of n so called non traditional communication means. Uh, the proliferation of different apps for communicating, peer to peer communications, the, the outside Kalia uh, communication channels, I don't have a number, but have increased dramatically since 2005. So um, you describe in your remarks that you wanted not a backdoor but a front door. And I'm trying to understand what that means technically, to have a, 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 an ability to decrypt with an order that does not create technical vulnerabilities that others could exploit, either foreign intelligence services or I, I think probably a lot of people believe our own intelligence services. Um, what? What, what are you envisioning when you talk about building in a front door lawful intercept decryption capability? Yeah, I don't think I'm smart enough to give you a, a highly reliable answer there. What I've been told by people smarter than I is that anytime there's a door, there's a risk that someone's going to try to pick the lock and get into the door. Uh, but if, if the door is built transparently in the front end, designed into the product, uh, the chances of a vulnerability being um, unseen are much lower than if it is cobbled on at the end uh, after the device has been created. So this us going to providers and saying, can you now build one, um, their response to us is justifiably, that's kind of a risky thing to do. And smart people have told me that the best way to do it, never risk-free, but far less risky, is to build it uh, at the front end. So you're not talking about necessarily a revival of the sort of key escrow idea from from the mid-90s. You're you, you're, you're speaking more thematically than that. Is that right? They Correct. Yep. Correct. That, that, that ideally, I like to see Kalia written so that a communications provider has an obligation to build a lawful intercept capability uh, into the product that they provide. So, Not that we hold some universal key. Gotcha. So um, 
on uh, one of your 60 Minutes, I think you're, you're the more recent one uh, interview. It's on every Sunday night. <laughs> it's the, For the rest it's of the, the season. It's the Jim Comey yeah, show. Yeah, it'll never end. Um, the, um, you were asked whether all of these interceptions take place with a warrant. And I was actually a little surprised with, at your answer. You, you said categorically that the FBI does not do uh, interceptions without a warrant. And I, I was a little bit puzzled by that because I, I can think of at least a few um, situations in which uh, you guys are authorized to do uh, interceptions without a warrant. And I was, I was wondering if there's like, so, is there some policy that that you've adopted that you categorically don't do surveillance without a warrant? Or when you said that, were you incorporating various warrant exceptions into, the, into your remarks? Yeah, that's a fair question. When I was asked that question, I gave an answer that I thought was fair and accurate. And, and uh, people gave me feedback afterwards saying it was insufficiently lawyerly, should have been longer. <laughs> and what about the exceptions? And so I think that's very fair feedback, actually. Um, and I wish I'd thought of it in the moment. But it remains true that in the over, over, overwhelming a uh, number of our cases, we have court authority to collect the content of emails or telephones. But there are exceptions to the warrant requirement. Uh, the two that leap to my mind are important. One is, they didn't leap to my mind then, they've leapt to my mind since, that consent, where someone gives us consent to monitor, we can be reading the content of emails or listening to telephone calls that are made to the consented party. And second, um, where there is collection on a non-US person overseas, under Section 702, FISA 702, uh, that is authorized by the court, if an American is communicating with that person, that communication is going to sit in the government's databases, and my agents doing an investigation will query that database and may see that email and read it. They do not go back to the court and get authority for the, 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 their look at it, uh, our view being that it was collected lawfully in the first place, but that's an exception uh, that if I thought about it in the moment, I would have mentioned it. So a lot of people are going to say, you know, we had this fight in the 90s. Um, the key escrow idea lost because building in insecurity is inherently a bad idea. Um, and that if you, want, if you want things to be secure, you got to build security, not build you know, other ways in. Um, in the same 60 Minutes episode, or maybe it was the other one, you said there are two types of American companies, the companies that have been, are being hacked by the Chinese and the companies that don't know they're being hacked by the Chinese. Isn't there a tension here between, on the one hand, the concerns about cybersecurity, and on the other hand, the insistence that we've got to build in a certain layer of insecurity for one particular set of actors? Are we ultimately facing a choice here between a secure internet and an insecure internet? I don't think so. I mean, this comes back to what I, I said, I think, in response to the first or second question, that it's about relative risk. Um, it, it, there is much more risk associated with the after-the-fact intercept capability being built in. There is a non-zero risk associated with building it in the first place. But there's also risk to us as a society by foregoing uh, the ability to collect that information with lawful authority. So my view, and other reasonable people may disagree, is that the risk mitigation associated with building at the front end and the, and the risk avoidance by not having a dark spot that's spreading across our entire country uh, makes sense. Let's go to all of you. Um, wow, we have a lot of questions. Let's start with Chris Goyen. Um, when, you, when I call on you, please, please wait for the mic. And uh, keep, please keep questions short. And let's frame them in the form of a question. Uh, hi, Director Comey. My name is Chris Segoyan. I work for the ACLU. Uh, over the last few years, we've learned that the lawful interception systems at Google and Microsoft have been hacked by foreign governments. Google and Microsoft were both hacked by the Chinese, and then Microsoft's law enforcement team was subsequently hacked by the Syrian Electronic Army. These are companies that invest vast sums in data security and are probably the leading companies on the security front. Uh, whether you want to call it a front door or, or a back door, if these companies are delivering end-to-end -end encrypted communications, the only logical way to provide law enforcement access is to escrow a key. And if the keys are there, whether they're in law enforcement hands, a third party, or in the company's hands, people will try and steal them. Uh, 
Last year, Foreign Policy ran an article by Matthew Aid in which they described the FBI, F, a team of FBI agents backing a trash truck into the Czech embassy's uh, facilities and stealing a cryptographic machine and the keys associated with it. I mean, I think many people don't really understand that the FBI is also in the business of stealing encryption keys uh, in, in its capacity as a foreign intelligence organization. So given that you know that keys can be stolen, given that these companies are constantly having uh, sophisticated adversaries trying to steal their system, uh, their, their private information, and given that we have multiple examples of lawful interception systems being successfully compromised, what gives you confidence that some small Silicon Valley company, when mandated to do so, can build a secure interception system? I don't think, so thank you for that question. I don't think that anybody uh, with complete confidence can build an interception proof uh, system. That's what I meant when I said the risk is non-zero. I simply think that when you aggregate the various risks and trade-offs, the alternative doesn't make any sense to me. Saying, well, because it's hard, because there's, we can't eliminate risk, therefore, a universal encryption, uh, and not just a, a going dark, but a complete darkness for law enforcement is the place we want to go. I agree with you. I think there's risk associated uh, with what I'm suggesting. I just think, given the, the other uh, risks involved, that it makes sense. David Sanger. Thank you, Director Comey, David Sanger from the New York Times. Um, you talked a lot about the enforcement side of this, uh, and you mentioned the pendulum swing from the, uh, from the Snowden disclosures, but you didn't talk very much about the NSA and, and others. And one of the things we've learned from the Snowden disclosures is that the NSA found ways around encryption at Google and other places by going into the communications between the servers and so forth. So when Apple and Google make these announcements, the kinds that you're concerned about, clearly they're trying to demonstrate to the Germans or to the Brazilians or anybody else who was outraged by these disclosures that there is no hole, that they have deliberately thrown away the key so that the NSA couldn't do that in their systems. That's essentially what's going on here. I haven't heard yet from the administration any kind of guarantee that if you created the kind of portal that you've described, front door or back door, that there would then be assurances that the NSA didn't do again what it was disclosed to have been doing before. So tell us a little bit about the discussion inside the administration about how you'd provide those assurances. It's a good, sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it's a good question. I, um, I don't think I, I'm in a position to talk about uh, discussions inside the administration. It actually, uh, in my 12 months, has not uh, been extensive because there's been lots of other things going on. Um, and I, I guess I probably wouldn't tell you anyway, David, what was going on inside the administration. <laughs> um, but I, I, I told, understand totally. That's why I'm not trying to jump on the companies. I understand totally uh, the market imperative. Look, I've worked for two companies before coming back to the government. I get it. Uh, but I think that uh, I think that we can address their concerns by being transparent as a country about here are the lawful authorities by which the government can enter uh, through Google's door or through uh, Apple's door so that they can assure their customers no one's getting in here except through clearly understood channels. Karen? Thanks, uh, Director Comey. I'm uh, Garrett Mitchell. I write the Mitchell Report, which is a publication with a slightly smaller circulation than Mr. Sanger's. Um, and um, T read it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, it is interesting to hear you talk in the abstract about uh, presumably the chief executive officers and the members of the C-suite in the companies that uh, are clearly at issue here as being um, well-intentioned, patriotic, et cetera. Uh, I wonder, uh, and yet, um, they don't want to go where you want to go. I wonder if you could characterize for us the, the nature of the argumentation that they use um, uh, uh, the, the logic, if you will, of their perspective 
And um, as you said, you know, um, one of the wonderful things about a democracy is that people can do that. One of the not so wonderful things about a democracy is that people can do that. And so we get nowhere. So I would be curious if you could characterize for us the, the point of view, the, the, the sort of internal logic uh, that those, um, the people that you're dealing with have and the, the, the soundness of that point of view, even uh, if you disagree with it. That's a good question. I don't want to talk about particular conversations because I want to make sure that conversations are robust. Um, uh, maybe in general, uh, I would draw it from some of the questions here and some of the things I alluded to in my remarks. They are responding to a market imperative right, where they're getting beat up around the world because uh, the American government is reading everything on your systems, and so their competitors are using it against them um, all around the world. And they're trying to respond to that by saying, no, no, that's not true. Uh, our stuff is protected. I get that. Um, and that makes sense for them to advocate that position. They're not responsible for um, the other risks that we've talked about. And so they're advocating, in good faith, a view that makes sense to me from their perspective I think what they're not able to advocate, because it's frankly not the thing they own, except as citizens in this great country, is the, the safety trade-off, the security trade-off. It's probably the best way to describe it. Yes, right, right here in the front. Thank you very much. Director, Paul Joyle from NSI and Board of Directors of InfraGod. I'd like to ask you a question based on, on my previous experience. One is a federal law enforcement officer as well as a Senate Intelligence Committee. In, a, in, in the past, in the 70s and 80s, we had a lot of debates concerning um, civil liberties and protections and, 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 the, and the activities of our intelligence service. Um, there was a response with attorney general guidelines to put in place rules and regulations until the law basically was changed or, or catch up. I understand the problem with Kalia. Uh, in the Internet of Things, it really doesn't address the problems that we have. But just like um, Aristotle said in his writings, and when he asked the question, should a city have walls, we have an obligation, one, to protect privacy. We also have an obligation to allow law enforcement to do its job to protect its citizens. Are you taking any steps short of a law change to try to put in systems that will assure the, uh, the, the, the American public that we're going to do a, a better job at protecting their privacy? Well, we have, that's a good question. Um, the FBI has a ton. Um, and if I get any complaint from my troops is that we have an overwhelming amount of policy um, that governs their ability to obtain information in investigations of all kinds. And my response to my folks is, I get, I get your frustration, but I like that. I like the restraint. So I'm not, I, I look at the restrictions on an FBI agent's ability to conduct an investigation, to collect electronic evidence, um, and they're pretty darn extensive. I mean, no one has suggested to me an improvement that's leaped to mind. So I'm focused on trying to get the law changed so that those with whom we interact with lawful process um, are able to comply with it. Hi, uh, Joel Margolis with Subsencio Inc. Um, what can you tell us about the Bureau's plan to update the Calia statute? Um, not much more than I just told you, uh, which is I'm hoping we can now start a dialogue with Congress on updating it. Uh, there had been an effort, I gather, underway before I took this job that got blown away uh, in the post-Snowden wind, which I understand. Um, but I think now it's an opportunity to, to maybe stand in that wind a little bit and have that conversation. So I think the first step is to talk to responsible, thoughtful people on the Hill about so what makes sense and how do we get that kicked around. Uh, Cam Carey. Thank you, uh, Director Comey. I'm uh, Cam Carey. Uh, I'm here at Brookings as a uh, visiting fellow, but uh, when I was at the Commerce Department, uh, uh, was uh, part of that effort, uh, went back and forth with your predecessor about uh, uh, some of the potential reforms to Kalea. A lot of the issues that have been raised uh, today were, were part of that discussion, but I, you know, I want to ask about uh, one other. Um, you know, as we deal with 
sort of the explosion of data. Um, you know, we there's also uh, the phenomenon, uh, and I think a, a widespread concern that uh, we're also going bright. There's a tremendous amount of digital information that is available to companies um, and to governments. Um, and you know, part of uh, one of the issues uh, uh, that, that we face in whatever we do in addressing public policies uh, to, to deal with that data is the impact on international norms. So my question is, you know, if, uh, and it sort of parallels some of the cybersecurity questions, if we go down this road um, uh, and you know, take steps that, that would break uh, encryption, what is the impact on more repressive countries around the world that will follow that example? It's a good question. I don't think um, it's something I've thought about, but frankly, not well enough to give you an intelligent answer at this point. I think that's got to be part of the discussion because I've also heard that people saying, well, OK, we can have transparency in the United States define clearly uh, what access is given and when. But that's a precedent then for repressive regimes to get anything they want. Um, others have said, well, the repressive regimes should get anything they want anyway as a condition of doing business there. Um, so I don't think I know enough at this point yet to give you a good enough answer. Yeah. Sir. Thank you, sir, for taking my question. My name is Anand Swarna, and I'm an author. And uh, I read uh, newspapers, and I read a lot of uh, about uh, surveillance and everything. But I have a question about my situation. Everything that I do the whole day, I can see in, as a technically generated dream. Uh, everything that I do, I don't know whom to contact for this kind of uh, I'm sorry, I missed the last part of that sentence. Every day, what's happening? Everything that I do in a whole day, I can see as a TV serial, uh, as a technically generated dream. And for this kind of, uh, I don't know whom to contact. I have no idea. Yeah. It's like Probably per somebody at Brookings. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was starting to call on people. Sorry, it's not my job. <laughs> no, no, it's your go job. Ahead. No, no, it's your job. Uh, Lance I'll Hoffman. Just duck out. Yeah. Lance Hoffman, George Washington University Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute. Um, I edited a book 20 years ago called Building in Big Brother, and it seems like we're in the same movie again, but maybe a little different, I hope, because I heard something you, you, you said, which was, what's the cost? And my question for you is, back then, we didn't have any, to my mind, serious uh, cost-benefit analyses that really people could trot out and say, look, here are the trade-offs. And it, is, has your organization or any other organization you know of yet made some serious cost-benefit analyses, not only economic, which are important, but also the social costs and law enforcement downsides and everything else? The, an the answer is not to my knowledge. Um, I've identified only costs and benefits in kind of the rough order of magnitude kind of way, but not in any quantitative sense so far as I'm, I know. It'd be useful. I'm sure smart people have. It'd be a useful part of the discussion. Evan Paris. Uh, Director, would you uh, acknowledge perhaps that uh, some of the distrust that you just spoke about uh, comes from the government not being fully truthful about what it was doing? With, I'm referring to to, direct, to, uh, to Clapper, uh, the testimony in Congress, and even the FBI's own history with uh, national security letters. Uh, so perhaps you know the distrust comes partly from that. Would you acknowledge that that, that may be part of the problem here? Yeah, except I'm going to. Uh, before I give you a yes, I want to I want to take apart your question a little bit, Evan. Um, uh, I don't agree with the predicate that uh, your characterization of Jim Clapper uh, in particular, but we can talk about offline another time. But I think a lot of it comes from uh, justifiable surprise on the part of the U.S. people uh, as to the extent and nature of the surveillance being conducted in the, in the name of the United States. Now, I say the U.S. people, I believe very strongly that their elected representatives had a complete insight into it. So when people talk about that, I say, yeah, I can understand people being freaked and surprised. Um, but I also think I've yet to see the rogue conduct, the lawless conduct that folks talk about. I see the government operating with all three branches. 
Uh, but that doesn't mean that folks aren't justifiably reacting, saying, whoa, they're doing what? Uh, and so I think that, more than anything else, has fed what I call the post-Snowden wind, which makes sense to me. Um, I mean, the scope of some of it, especially to someone who doesn't live in it, um, breathtaking. Yeah. Ma'am? My name is Li Yang. Uh, I really appreciate it. ABHT can be here. Now you got to know all the stories. I submit uh, all the documents, some evidence to the Department of Justice and many agencies or lawmakers. They don't really give response. So now my question is, you say you contact with three branches. So now suppose uh, Snowden, and uh, we are talking about a lot of surveillance. We are talking about people's uh, email or something have been hacked. So now my question is, can you really just simply based on that fact, then you identify who is us hacking people's email or account or terminating their social medias? I really don't think I'm in a position to answer that. <laughs> Greg Nojan. Hi, I'm Greg Noj. I'm from the Center for Democracy and Technology. Talk to us a little bit more about the international implications of these ideas. I mean, for example, if you're uh, Apple or you're um, selling Androids, you can't sell an NSA, FBI-ready iPhone in Europe. Uh, so what are you going to do? Are, are you expecting them to build two kinds of iPhones, uh, two kinds of Android phones? Are they going to have to build three or four or six kinds when other countries follow our lead and impose the same kind of mandates you're talking about? And what happens in the Indias and the United Kingdoms of the world? It's a great question. I mean, I don't want to repeat the answer I gave earlier. I wouldn't. I don't think I'd market it as an FBI and NSA ready phone. <laughs> uh, maybe an FBI ready phone. We have. A, we may have a better brand around the world. Um, but I, instead, I, again, I haven't, I, I haven't gamed this out in my head completely, but I, I could imagine them saying, um, we as an American domiciled corporation will comply with lawful process, um, you know, enacted pursuant to law, um, excuse me, pursuant to law enacted by Congress, we will comply with requests of the U.S. government for uh, information in connection with lawful investigations. And that it, it wouldn't be about marketing the phone, it would be about them retaining some capability uh, to be able to access the information. And I don't, I, I, again, I'm not smart enough technically to figure out how that would work, but something like that. Um, but I, I, I think it's a, it, it's a serious conversation to have about how they would do it in particular. Uh, now, what we may get is to a place where the U.S., through its Congress, says, you know what, we need to force this on American companies. And maybe they'll take a hit. Someone in, in some other country will say, ah, we sell a phone that even with lawful authority people can get into, but that we as a society are willing to, to have American companies uh, take that hit. Uh, that's why we have to have the conversation. We have time for a couple more questions. I'm going to try to get a few people uh, and then let the director uh, wrap up. Uh, sir. Hi, Mike Levine with ABC. Uh, you talk about the balance and sort of cost benefit, and you brought up the uh, sort of hypothetical example of a kid being kidnapped and trying to access the information. Do you know of any specific cases where someone was in danger, was rescued, but wouldn't have been rescued had you been blocked from, from the information you're talking about today? Um, that's a good question. I think I gave you four cases where the information on the phone um, which would be blocked if it was encrypted, would it not have been available to us? But that was the prosecution versus they being harmed. I see. So rescuing someone before they're harmed? Correct. Someone in the trunk of a car or something? I, I don't think I know yet. I've asked my folks just to canvas. I've asked our state and local partners. Um, are there examples where this, I think I see enough, uh, but I don't think I've found that one yet. Uh, I'm not looking. Here's the thing. When I was preparing this speech, one of the things that I was inclined to talk about was uh, to avoid those kinds of sort of uh, edge cases, because I'm not looking to frighten people. Uh, logic tells me there are going to be cases just like that, but but the the theory of the case is the main bulk of law enforcement activity. Uh, 
But that said, I don't know the answer. I haven't found one yet. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Over there, sir. Thank you, Lucas Tomlinson, Fox News. Uh, slightly off topic, sir. Is there any credible evidence that uh, terrorists can use Ebola as a bioagent here in the United States? Thank you. No. <laughs> do you have any, uh, do you want to wrap up in? No, I hope this is the beginning of a robust dialogue in this country about this challenge. Like I said, I, I don't think I have the wisdom or the, no, or the technical knowledge to say, here's what it ought to look like. But I see a problem that uh, when I last left government was blinking, blinking red kind of in the distance, the corner of my eye, it's now blinking red directly in front of me. And I want to make sure that we don't ever get to a place where people then say to me, how did this happen that we got to this place without us making a thoughtful choice? We as a country may decide this is where we want to go. We want uh, to have unlimited end-to-end -end encryption on every device that we use. Okay, but we as a country should make that decision. And that's the conversation I'm trying to foster so that we go there the way a democracy should. I want to thank the director for, for coming in and having this conversation. Uh, please stay in your seats while he makes his way out so that he can actually get out. Um, please join me in thanking him. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thanks.